Michael, how's the mood in the camp after what I'm sure was probably a sore one to concede so late, but ultimately a point going into Sunday? Yeah, it was uh, afterwards the change room wasn't great, if I'm honest. Obviously, uh, we felt a lot of frustration because overall, outside the first 30 minutes, we're, we're playing a big rival and, and we didn't give up any chances until we conceded. Um, and even then in that goal, there's a lot of regret in the way that we conceded it. But in the main, it was a really positive performance. I think when the dust settles, I think we're, we're content enough with the performance, but knowing that we can do more over time, I think that's the big thing for us. It's every week trying to get better and stronger as we go. What do you think you've learnt from the group of players that you've got here? We've seen great character in the last minute, like up at Petardre, we've seen convincing performances against Motherwell, and then this latest performance. What do you think you see in the group? Well, I think since Ben and, and Connor have been back together, we've built a lot stronger. Bourne has come back in and performed well. In, in the last month, I've seen a young boy in Adam Devine showcase himself as well. Uh, so that's good. John Suter back in training today is really positive. Leon King's doing well. So all of a sudden, that looks a lot more positive. We've rotated the midfielders a lot because we've needed to. You know, John's been playing and training with injections. I had to, I've had to ease off and on, on him. He gets a whack in the second half and we're still in pain for quite a while after the game. Uh, Glenn, as I've mentioned, has had easy shoes and Jack O'Hee. So in terms of the squad, everybody seems in a more healthy place. Antonio and Kamara have had another week. All of a sudden you go out to train and stay and you've got three number nines. It looks a lot more stronger than what it did a, a, a few weeks ago. Alfredo, in, to his credit, because I know there's a lot written and said about him, uh, he's managed to play the last two or three games when maybe another player wouldn't. So uh, what I can see is that everyone's committed and all in. As we get people back, the form will come. They need a bit of kick in terms of belief, which is what I said to them at half-time in the game. And I thought they performed well in a, in a game probably where they surprised one or two people who were sharpening their pencils to write something else. I thought we performed well in the game. We're disappointed not to win it. No. Have you been disappointed? Sorry. No, you got it. Have you been disappointed by the, the criticism of Alfredo in particular? He's been savaged by various people over the last week. I don't read it all, I just sense it and all I can do is go off his energy here in the building. Like His situation is not ideal as well if people want to go for him about his form and stuff. But I, I see a different boy inside. I think he's working to what he's working with. I'm probably the only person other than him who knows what, you know, what he's going through physically at the minute to get himself fit and to stay fit because he's played with one or two knocks. So I'm OK. Um, Alfredo's a big boy. He's been he's been taking this for three or four years now. I actually think it's quite tame compared to how it was when I first came to Scotland. <laughs> are, you, um, are you amused or bemused that four days after the game, the back reaches are still dominated by supposed controversy over VAR? Listen, I think VAR, we all wanted it, now we've got it, and now we're not sure if we want it or not. So I think that's where we're at. I think um, at the time, obviously, I'm seeing it, I don't see it too after the game. So I wasn't sure at the time whether it was or wasn't. I see one player for them appeal for it, not everybody. And then you read the law and the law says one thing and it's how that law is then perceived. And the, the officials on the, on the day perceived it a certain way. I thought actually John and the staff that were there, the, the officials that were there, I thought they had a good game. For an old firm game, I thought they managed the game really well. He didn't ban cards out early. It was two teams going, I thought it was a cracking game. I thought two teams went head to head uh, for the full 90 minutes. And I thought John and, and the other officials managed the game on the day very, very well. I actually thought that when the game ended, you know, there's always some things you think can go for you or against you. When you read the, the rule, it seems like they got it to the letter. Do you think that's just a, a normal part of new technology settling in or do you think people are trying to stake out a little bit of territory using their elbows to, to try, and, try and influence the, the operators? No, listen, I, I just think it's, it's what happens, the fallout after a derby, something's got to be for a reason why people didn't play well. I think, it's your, did you not play well? Did the other team play well? All these things go in it. I, I'm a manager that wants to try and stay away from that. I realise there's the human element involved. Even when you go to VAR, it's still a human on the other side who's got to make a call there, whether it is or it isn't, in relation to the laws. I don't think anyone sat in this room now or any manager knows the laws as good as the officials. You know, some of the laws seem to change and we're told them, but it's not our day in, day out job to know it. Um, with the handballs, I suppose the whole of the world football is, is a little bit unsure at times, but when you see what's actually written, then I think they got the decision right. 
How pleased were you to see John Suter back in training today? Really pleased. Obviously, we spoke about him last week. He's only when he played that game earlier in the season. He was probably too honest when he played at Livingston, you know, because he was in pain going into the game, and ultimately it's cost him a little bit of his Rangers career. But hopefully now he's he's back. We took a little bit longer to try to get to the bottom of some of the issues that he's had, and we're hopeful that that we have. But I think the proof will be in the coming months with John if he can stay fit, because if he is, I think he's a very good player, and he's. Even today, his first session back in the group, he showed one or two things that were very pleasing. So uh, he was signed here as, as a Scottish player, Scottish international that knew the league, that was coming in at a good age. We felt his best days were in front of him and hopefully that is the case now. When would you expect to see him vying for the first team? I think by the end of the month, I think very similar to Yanis, by the end of the month we'll be, you know, Yanis has been training now contact, which is a big thing when you come off a, of an injury like that. And obviously John's just gone straight back in into contact because it's a different type of injury. So let's give him a good couple of weeks. We've got a busy schedule before that, but if we sort of earmarked around the St Johnston game at the end of the month, uh, we won't be too far out for both of those boys. I guess that's like two January signings for you then. Yeah, because you're going to get on to January signings now, aren't you? So yeah. <laughs> it won't be the only two, I would say. You're close to anything at the moment? We've spoken to two or three players. Our phone's not stopped, really. There's a lot of players interested in coming here. I've got to make sure they're the right one. I'm a little bit fussy. I want to sit in front of a player and I want to look in his eyes. It's all right doing something over Zoom. Uh, my schedule's been pretty packed out. Uh, up until that game uh, last Monday. This week's been spent meeting people face to face and getting a feel for them, telling them exactly what I want, not them the other way around in terms of what they're expecting, what I'm expecting from them and, and the role that I want them to play coming in. Because when we're recruiting, I'm recruiting players for real specific roles. It's not just about a collection of players coming in. I want to recruit a player that comes in and does a very specific job for us in the squad because I think that's what we need right now. I, I, I said when I first come in the job, I didn't think it was as broken as people were making out. The only thing that can prove that is performances on the pitch. And I think three or four of the right additions uh, can, can pull everything together in the right direction. Michael, you mentioned that you spoke to two or three players. Would you hope to do that fairly soon in terms of getting these guys out? Yeah, I think so. Like We've obviously got this game this week and then we've got a free week into the semi-final with, with Aberdeen. Uh, two really big games for us. But in that time, there's no midweek game, so it does give me more time to, to do things. I think then the negotiation part takes place, doesn't it? So I'm not so much involved in that. Uh, that that's with the agents and the football clubs that are involved. But I would say that the two or three that I've spoken to are very keen to come and sooner rather than later, same on our side. So let's see. Uh, there won't be anyone in, obviously, before this weekend. Well, in terms of um, that's players in, obviously, in terms of players out, it feels like in, in modern football, there's a bit more of a move towards players running down their contracts. Obviously, we've got a couple of high-profile examples just now. Is that just a kind of modern football player power thing, that players are more likely to do that? Or are there any benefits for the club or yourself as a coach to having players that are needing the end of their contract and maybe being a little hungrier? I think it's two ways. I think you know the player will want the best contract for himself. He might be waiting. You know, it's still different cases. If it's your, if it's if it's a player that's a main starter, obviously there's a bit of negotiation going on and there's a bit of honesty. There's been a lot of change in the club recently. So if you put yourself in the shoes of the player and the club, are you going to commit to another three or four year contract not knowing who the manager is and the way things are going to go? So I think that's natural. There's one or two that are at a different stage of their career and have to show, you know, they have to keep showing what they have they, they've done previously that they can do that moving forward. All those conversations will happen in the coming days and weeks. I think for us uh, as a staff coming in, we came into a club where we had a lot of injuries and we had a heavy schedule over the Christmas period. We've now come out the other side of that and barring five minutes in the derby, it would have been perfect, wouldn't it? So it's just, I think we're in a positive place moving forward. Now it's me deciding who I think we should move forward with. And then if it's one or two of the players that are out of contract, can we give them an offer based on where we think they're going, their value in the future or their age that they want to sign? So those conversations will happen now. They haven't happened already. And there's been some criticism of James Tavernier from Monday in terms of the game, but also at points this season. Um, people have been saying he's maybe not the player he was. Where do you stand on his, his role on the team just now? 
No, I think, listen, he took a high-pressure penalty at a big moment in the game and, and scored. I thought, obviously, Maeda got the better of him for the first goal. There's a few mistakes in, in both goals. I thought Maeda started the game very well. And I thought at times then, as the game went on, Tav did very well. So, listen, I think that's what happens when you're playing against good players. At different times in the game, you've got to tussle and get through it. And James has uh, got my full back in. Uh, he's got a young one now who's coming along who wants to play. And uh, so it's interesting. I like James when someone's breathing down his neck. I think that was, we saw the best of him when uh, Nathan Patterson was chasing him down. And, and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get a reaction out of Adam because I thought Adam did really well for three or four games. And likewise, when Ridvan's fit, Borna's got a, I want that, I want that competition, not just for James, for everybody. And we've not had it. In, it the, the reality is we haven't had it. And I think that everyone's got to jump up a notch if they're, they're worried whether they're going to be playing or not. These players that you're talking to, are they permanent deals you're looking at, Michael, not loan deals? Yeah, no, no loans this month. Like if, if I'll have to explain to you if we were to take a loan, but the plan, my plan is no loans this month. We don't need anyone to come in this club for six months as a short term. We don't want that. We want more certainty. I think there's been a bit, uncer bit of uncertainty about too many players. I want to take uncertainty away. Uncertainty away in terms of the way that we're going to play, the clarity and the standards, but also then people's situations. In the next three or four weeks, I'm hoping we get to the end of the majority of that. Anyone coming in now will be with a view to them being an important player for Rangers for the next two or three seasons. I think that's really important. When you sit down with these players, you talk about you know looking them in the eye, sussing them out. What are the characteristics you're looking for in these players that would make them up a Rangers player? Well, there's two things. There's on the pitch and then there's off the pitch around the building. So in terms of are they the right sort of person to come into our environment? Are they going to fit? Sometimes there's a lot of good players out there, but are they going to fit the squad that you've got now? And they'll come in for on the pitch for very, very specific roles. So they understand what they're coming in. I don't really like changing people. So if I see a player outside and he plays a certain way, I like the easiest way to transfer talent is to put a lot of the same things around them. And I think there'll be, diff there'll be a difference. You'll see maybe someone coming in who you think, OK, he's already made now. And there might be one or two you think, oh, that's an interesting one. Rangers have done one or two of them things before. And he's a player with high promise, but you'll definitely be able to see how they're going to fit into our team. I think in terms of being around the building, the players I want to work with, I'm a development coach. That's the, where I've come from. And I'm very, very much on growth and development and you versus yourself as like a daily mantra in terms of improving. So I only want people that come in here, young, hungry and vibrant to take this club forward, but ultimately to take themselves forward. I think that's what we have to do inside the building. People have got to want to improve themselves. So the individual first, and then that builds into the whole team. That, that's a little bit around the conversation. That's why it's better to meet someone and get a feel for someone sat across a table and, and probably have a longer conversation about life and where they're going. I think once I'm sat with someone, the football part in my mind, in terms of what they're going to do on the pitch, is probably already in place. Then it's really, can I get a connection with them? We work in a unique way where each player has got a member of staff that works closely with them as a guide and drives them every day. But the, the person who's got to own it is the player. And so for me, I need to see that. I don't want anyone who's at the top of their mountain and come into Rangers to sort of like sit at the top of the mountain. I don't want that. I want people still climbing it and who are young and hungry. Basically, a, a player version of what I think the management team is, a management team that needs to prove a lot. And I think that's what I want with the players as well. How heavily involved have you been in identifying these players that are once potentially coming in this month? Are these all players that you've been previously aware of? Yeah, look, the club would have had lists and they've been working a certain way, like all, all clubs will do. Our recruitment side here, I think it's very, very strong in terms of if I want to go and get reports on a player, I can go and get them in-house. I don't have to ring a load of contacts. I certainly do that to get a 360 and then I take my own feeling. I like to take a gamble because I believe in development and people growing uh, to perform. I don't think any club in Scotland buys the finished product. I think we have to kick onwards and upwards with the players. The players that come in this club will be chosen by myself along with the recommendations of the recruitment staff, but no player would come into Rangers without the manager's say so. And in my time working at the club previously, that never happened then either. Just, you mentioned earlier that uh, John Lundstrom had to take an injection before the Celtic game. Is that something he's having to do quite regularly? And where is he at in terms of his fitness ahead of the United match? He'll be fit for the game at the weekend. It was a really sore one. He did it against Hibs. 
He did it against Hibbs. He got caught in the in the ribs in the chest area, and it really flared up. He had some problems breathing in the days afterwards. So he's not done a lot of training between the games. He took the injection and he took a whack the other day. Naturally, knowing John and he's got that lovely scouse mentality, he's a tough boy. But <clears> and he wanted to continue. But after the game, he was still in a lot of pain. It was a it was a big moment. It hasn't been spoken about. It was a big moment in the game the other day because. John's probably, at this moment in time, the, the midfielder who's physically the most fit in our team. He's been playing the most. And to lose him wasn't something that was ideal in the game. And obviously, um, we concede uh, with him not on the pitch. So it was, it was frustrating. But he'll be back for this weekend. And as I say, every day that goes past, he's healing. Michael, no one's mentioned it yet, but it was in the email today. You've been named manager of the month. How does that feel? And uh, what a great start that is to you. Team as Rangers manager. Yeah, look, a great start. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting it. Cause I wasn't even thinking about. It. I've not really had time to think about. It. It's nice. It's nice. It's, uh, it's not the award that I want us to have. I want us to have a lot more. But listen, it's a sign that you know, it, and the credit goes to the players because I've come in and changed a lot in terms of the way that we play, the way that we train, the intensity and 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 the ideas. The players have had to take on a lot. I've chopped and changed the team as well to give everyone an opportunity. Um, and so, yeah, they deserve the credit because they go and play. It wasn't me that scored in the 96 minute at Aberdeen, was it? It was Scotty Arfield. So, if that don't go in, I'm not getting that award, maybe. So, look, fair play to the players. It's a, it's a nice one, but it's not saying I want to sit and dwell on too much. There's been some rumours about Phil Hollander and his future, given the current injury situation and his contract stats. What's the latest in that? Phil Hollander's a fantastic player who, for what for whatever reason in the last year and a half has not been able to play and show it. I thought he, when, he was, when he was fit, he was always an excellent player for the club. I don't think anybody um, wants to be injured. Phil certainly doesn't. Um, on a personal level, while he has been out, he's, his wife's given birth to twins, which is lovely for him as a, as a dad. Me and Phil get on really well. I think at this moment in time, Phil needs to focus on his rehab. And if he gets through his rehab and he gets fit at 29, I think Phil Hollander's still got a good future in front of him. Let's hope that this injury is the last ones he has because we have to remind ourselves he did come from Serie A and he was a full international before the injury. And when people are injured, you know, the perception sometimes is, is people are happy being injured. But I can tell you Phil's not. He's in every day. Don't skip a day. Thanks, guys. Hey, on the Zoom, Derek. Good afternoon. Congratulations on the Manager of the Month award. I just wanted to ask you about someone who came in when you were a coach at the club, but unfortunately we've not seen him. I wonder if you can give an update on Namdi off the board at all and what the latest is with him. Yeah, Namdi's situation is still with a specialist, as you can imagine, with, with that sort of. Um, situation the 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 people in the public and the people that are in the staff here we're not experts and it's an area that you need to get real specialist opinion on you need to get more than one opinion um, he's been able to do some physical activity but obviously um, the care and the duty that we've got in this one is really really big so there's no news officially on it it's just uh, it's still in the way in the background i'm up to speed with it all but there's a bit of privacy in this one as well Yes, Michael. Jordan or Colin? Colin, yeah? Yeah, hi, hi Michael. I'm just wondering if you get any specific update around Tom Lawrence and his recovery is doing and when we can expect to see him back. Tom was away seeing a specialist again yesterday just to get some sort of idea of, of what comes next. Um, he's had a little bit of discomfort, so I know we said towards the end of this month we might that might now be in jeopardy. It's not definitely in jeopardy, but we need to... Um, when players come back from rehab, you know, you had Connor Goldson come back three weeks ahead of schedule and you have other players sometimes don't feel so good and, and delayed. So at this moment in time, there's no good or bad news. It just is where it is. We just need to, we need to get an update on that one. John? Hi, Michael. Um, I know the last couple of weeks we've spoken about potentially adding another midfielder to the squad. Um, is that one of the players that you've maybe been speaking to this week? And is it a different type of midfielder you're looking to add to the squad? I'm looking to raise the technical ability across the across the squad, like you always do, and and obviously to bring some some dynamic, some athleticism into the squad in general. I'm also looking for people that I think can come and play in front of our crowd and and relish that opportunity of playing and actually rise to that challenge and sort of prosper in it. So, 
You, if you're trying to get something specific out of me, George, you won't. I'm looking for players in all positions that are good enough to play. So this month, there's a, a world of opportunities, really.